In this video, we're going to look at the properties of living things and we're going to focus on homeostasis and look at positive feedback loops and negative feedback loops. There are seven properties of living things, things that everything that's alive from bacteria to mushrooms to dogs and humans that all living things have in common. Everything that is alive has macromolecules. The macromolecules are proteins, carbohydrates, fats, and nucleic acids. So those molecules might be a little bit different. So a crab, for example, is going to have a different polysaccharide to make up the shell compared to the glycogen that humans store. But we all have, all living things have macromolecules, those proteins, carbs, fats, and nucleic acids. All living things are composed of cells. Whether you're a single-celled prokaryotic bacterial cell or a multicellular human or peach tree. So everything that is alive is made of cells. Everything that is alive has growth and metabolism. So even single-celled bacterial cells will grow and then they will reproduce. And everything that is alive has metabolism and that means that they have to acquire energy in some form and then convert that energy into chemical energy that can be used. So plants, for example, can use the sun to get energy and make glucose and then make ATP, whereas we have to consume molecules like chicken and salad so that we can convert those molecules into ATP. Everything that's alive has hereditary material, and that hereditary material is DNA. DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid, and that DNA is passed on to offspring. Everything that's alive will evolve, so everything has evolution. Different organisms are going to pass on different traits to their offspring, and the offspring that acquire the traits that makes them most able to survive that environment will then live to reproduce and pass on their DNA. So slight changes in DNA are always being passed on, and that is evolution. And lastly, everything that's alive has homeostasis, and that means it has some mechanisms for regulating its internal environment. I want to focus on how that homeostasis works in humans, and we're going to look at a few examples. But first, I want to explain the difference between internal and external environment. In this diagram, we have a picture of a human, and it's showing the digestive system. Here we have the oral cavity, we're going to eat food and drink water and coffee and that's going to go through the lumen of these structures, the esophagus and the stomach and the small and large intestine. When it's inside the lumen of these structures, that is technically the external environment because it is connected to the outside. So that is not regulated. We can't regulate the external environment. We can only regulate inside our internal environment. And that's going to be the fluid that surrounds all of our cells. That fluid is called interstitial fluid. We can regulate the internal environment. So that is our interstitial fluid interstitial fluid and the other fluid that surrounds our cells in a way is our blood plasma we can regulate what is in the blood so we have mechanisms for making sure that this fluid that is around our cells contains the right nutrients and ion concentrations. There's enough oxygen, it's the right temperature. There's a lot of things that have to be regulated so that the cell can function properly. The things that are considered external environment is anything that is basically connected with the outside environment. So that includes our ear canals and our entire digestive tract. Um, it will include our sinuses and it will also include our respiratory tract. So our throat and our trachea, which is going to be in front of the esophagus, which will branch out to the lungs. Let's look at a negative feedback loop. A negative feedback loop is the main way 
that we regulate um, all kinds of factors inside of our body. And in this negative feedback loop, we always have the same order of things going on. So first we're gonna have some kind of a stimulus. That stimulus is going to trigger specific receptors. I'm going to look more specifically at some receptors in a minute. Those receptors are going to send information to an integrating center. Most of the time it's some region of our brain, but it could also be glands like the adrenal glands, or it could be our pancreas. We're going to look at an example where the integrating center is the pancreas. Then this integrating center is going to determine the level of that specific sensory information. Like let's suppose it's temperature. If the body temperature is getting too hot, the integrating center will compare that sensory information with its set point. We have a general level that different substances should be in our body. So we have a range for blood sugar. We have a range, a very tiny range for blood pH. We need to have a certain amount of oxygen. When those substances are away from the set point, then we have to do something so that we can bring it back to the set point so that we have the right amount of blood sugar and the right amount of oxygen. If things can't be within a normal physiological range, then we're gonna have symptoms. And if we can't bring that substance back into its normal range, then we're gonna end up with a disease. So we need to keep everything regulated when all of our um, factors and substances are in the right physiological range, then we're healthy. Let's suppose something is off of the set point. It's outside of its normal range. Now the integrating center has to trigger effectors and the effectors will do something. So for example, if you're too hot, let's suppose you're too hot, then one thing that could happen is the effectors could trigger sweating. So the effectors could be sweat glands. So the integrating center will trigger different effectors so that causes a different effect. And then in the end, that's going to result in a response. In a negative feedback loop, the response is always going to be counteracting whatever the stimulus was. If the stimulus means we're too hot, our temperature is too high, then the effect is going to be that we cool down by sweating. Different factors will have different receptors and different effectors so that we can keep things in balance. Receptors are very specific. If you have, um, for example, a chemical like glucose, blood sugar, then chemoreceptors are going to detect that blood sugar. We're going to have specific receptors that detect blood pressure or body temperature. Okay, so here's a list of all of the different kind of receptors and the stimulus that they will detect. Osmoreceptors detect osmolarity. This is basically ions and water concentrations. Ions would be things like salt, like sodium and chloride. We have tactile receptors in our skin and muscles and other parts of your body that you can feel touch, pressure, and vibration. Baroreceptors will detect pressure. Photoreceptors detect light. We only have photoreceptors in the retina. Mechanoreceptors detect stretch or distortion. And actually, baroreceptors are a type of mechanoreceptor. Proprioceptors detect your body position. We have these in our inner ear to help us know if we're moving, standing, sitting, lying down, we can tell where our body parts are. Nociceptors detect pain. These are not a specific membrane protein. These can be nerve endings of sensory neurons. And thermoreceptors detect temperature. The one thing I want to point out about receptors is that they are all specific. 
So thermoreceptors can only detect temperature. Nociceptors can only detect pain. So now I want to go through two different examples of negative feedback. Negative feedback. And now the stimulus is going to be a decrease in body temperature. So let's suppose you're standing outside in the winter waiting for the bus and it's cold and your core body temperature starts to decrease. What's going to happen? First, we need to have a receptor that is going to detect that change in body temperature. And thermoreceptors detect temperature. The thermoreceptors are going to send that temperature information to the integrating center. In the brain, we have a specific region called the hypothalamus. And this detects our body temperature and it has a set point and it knows that our body temperature should be about 37 degrees Celsius. It shouldn't fluctuate too much from that because this is where our body functions. So when our thermoreceptors send temperature information to the hypothalamus, if this is different from the set point because we're cold, then we have to trigger effectors. If we're going to try to increase our body temperature, one thing we can trigger is the muscles to cause shivering. Another thing we could trigger would be blood vessels. When we are cold, blood vessels will constrict. When blood vessels constrict, it helps to keep the heat inside of our body. And when we're too hot, blood vessels at the surface will dilate to help get rid of extra heat. These effectors are going to cause a response and the response is going to be to increase our body temperature. So in a negative feedback loop, the response is counteracting the original stimulus. So then we maintain our body temperature. If let's suppose you kept getting colder and colder and colder, your body would shiver more, you would constrict more blood vessels, you would reroute blood from your extremities to your core, to your brain and your, your thoracic region where you have heart and lungs. And then eventually, if you couldn't maintain that body temperature, you would go into hypothermia. And now you're in a pathological state and not a normal physiological state. So it's important to know that in homeostasis, we're in a normal, healthy, physiological range. When you can't be in homeostasis, then you have a disease or a condition or symptoms or something. In this example, we're gonna look at blood sugar. Let's suppose we increase our blood sugar. We do this every time we eat food. We're gonna eat food, blood sugar's gonna go up. We need receptors, chemo receptors, detect chemicals like glucose. What is the integrating center? In this example, our pancreas is going to detect blood sugar increases. We have a range that our blood sugar should be in, and when our blood sugar goes up too much, the pancreas is going to cause the release of insulin. Insulin is a hormone that tells the cells to take up blood sugar. And then what's the response? The response is going to counteract the original stimulus. The original stimulus was an increase in blood sugar. When we produce insulin, we are going to decrease blood sugar, also called glucose. So that's how a negative feedback mechanism works. As you watch more videos from this course, you're going to see that we talk a lot about how we regulate our physiology. It's a very key component to maintaining health. One last thing that I want to look at is positive feedback. It is the opposite of negative feedback. In a positive feedback loop, we will have a stimulus that is going to trigger receptors. Just like before, there's going to be an integrating center that is going to compare that information with a set point. But now the response is different. In a positive feedback loop, the response is going to increase the original stimulus. 
Can you think of any examples in physiology where you would have a stimulus that causes an effect that increases that stimulus? How about uterine contractions? This is an example of positive feedback. We have a baby inside of a uterus and the pressure is going to cause contractions and this is going to keep increasing. So let's go through this process. You have a uterine contraction that increases the pressure inside the uterus and that's going to trigger receptors. In this example, it is going to be a mechanoreceptor that is going to detect the contracting uterus. Those mechanoreceptors are going to send information to an integrating center. In this example, it is also the hypothalamus that will look at this information. The hypothalamus will take that information and it is going to trigger an effector. In this example, the effector is going to be oxytocin. Oxytocin is a hormone that causes the uterus to contract. So the response in a positive feedback loop is to increase the original stimulus. And in this positive feedback loop, the stimulus is going to keep increasing and uterine contractions will keep happening until the baby is born and there's no more pressure on that uterus. So those are the differences between a negative feedback loop and a positive feedback loop. In our bodies, most of the time when we talk about regulating things like blood sugar, ion levels, body temperature, blood pressure, those things are most commonly regulated by negative feedback mechanisms.